The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. It's coming. All these voices. My name is James Hurst. Right back. and welcome to another episode of Staring into the Abyss. I am your host, horror author James Hershey Jr. And with me as always, my co-host, old boy James Ash. How you doing, brother? I'm doing pretty good. How's everybody tonight? Thank you, brother. Ever since I was a very small child, I have been fascinated by dinosaurs. Now, I've often wished that it was possible to actually study them in person. The chance to see a Velociraptor or a T-Rex hunt in person would be the opportunity of a lifetime. Unfortunately, dinosaurs went extinct millions of years ago. Or did they? What if there were a few species that somehow managed to survive? Many people have theorized that the Loch Ness Monster and Champ from Lake Champlain might be plesiosaurs which is an ancient aquatic dinosaur. That is one very well-known example of a possible dinosaur that still exists today. In all reality, there are lots of different species that are alive on Earth now that were here in the time of the dinosaurs. You have many species of sharks, the lancet fish, the caiman, bees, crabs, sea stars, sea cucumbers, crocodiles, and even the duck-billed platypus, if you can believe that. On tonight's episode, we are going to be talking about a creature that, if it exists, might also come from the world of dinosaurs. This is going to be another one of our cryptozoological shows that everybody likes so much. And tonight we are going to be talking about the Okele Membe. The Mokele Membe is a water-dwelling creature that is found in the Congo River Basin. Mokele Membe roughly translates to one who stops the flow of rivers. And that seems rather appropriate for a creature that comes from the time of dinosaurs. The Mokele Membe resembles the Brontosaurus, which is a dinosaur that I'm sure that most of you listening are familiar with. Now, the creature is not as large as a brontosaurus. Uh, Witnesses describe it being a little bit larger than an elephant with smooth brownish gray skin, a long flexible neck, and either a single long tooth or a horn. I would guess on that one, probably a horn because it's kind of silly to have one single long tooth. I don't see any, any evolutionary advantage to having just one long tooth. Witnesses also report a long and very muscular tail that is capable of reducing a boat to kindling with a single strike. 
The first official report of the creature appeared in 1909 in the book Beast and Men, which was the autobiography of big game hunter Carl Hagenbeck. He claimed to have heard from two separate sources about a creature in Rhodesia that the natives described as half elephant and half dragon. Now, according to the natives, the creature feeds on hippos, and when the area that the Mokele Membe was supposed to live was examined, there was a smaller population of hippos than other areas. Now, this is going to be important later on, because here you have this group of, of natives saying that the creature feeds on hippos. At least that's what Carl Hagenbeck is claiming. So remember that for later. In 1911, a German adventurer named Lieutenant Paul Gratz wrote, and I quote, the crocodile is found only in very isolated specimens in Lake Bangawulu, except in the mouth of the large rivers at the north. In the swamp lives the Nasanga, much feared by the natives, a degenerate saurian, which one might confuse with a crocodile were it not that its skin has no scales and its toes are armed with claws. I did not succeed in shooting a Nasanga, but on the island of Mobala, I came by some strips of its skin." End quote. Now, here Nasanga is another one of the native names for this creature. So he's talking about the Mokele Membe here. And this report is a very important piece of evidence when you are considering whether the Mokele Membe actually exists, because Mr. Gratz claims to have actually gotten some of the strips of the creature's skin. It wouldn't be possible to gather strips of skin from an imaginary animal. So at least according to his account, this is a flesh and blood creature that has skin. That's important as well. I know that sounds silly to say that, you know, it has skin because of course it has skin if it's a living creature. Because you wouldn't really want to see a creature that didn't have skin. That'd be pretty disgusting. But the reason that's important is because one of the theories on Mokele Membe is that it is some spirit creature, that it's not a real living creature, it's a spirit creature. But we see over and over again in all these different accounts, in the first one it eats hippos. A spirit has no reason to have to eat hippos, it doesn't need to feed. This one, we're talking about it has skin that this guy got strips of. So that once again tells you that this is a flesh and blood creature and not a spirit. Now, misidentification of the skin in this account is always a possibility. But the way I look at it, as an adventurer, he would have been familiar with the native wildlife in the area. And once you add on top of that the expertise of the local native tribes, you would think that if the strips of skin belonged to an ordinary creature that was known to inhabit the area, either one or, or most likely both of them would have easily been able to identify the animal that the skin came from. But instead, he's claiming here that it came from the Mokele Membe. Another report comes from German captain Ludwig Freiherr von Stein zu Latznitz, which in addition to being known for having a ridiculously long name that's hard to pronounce, was also ordered to conduct a survey of the German colonies in what is now Cameroon in 1913. He had heard stories of an enormous reptile called the Mokele Membe, which was said to live in the jungles, and he included a description of this creature in his official report. Von Stein worded his report with the utmost caution because, frankly, he was afraid that his report might be seen as unbelievable. Despite risking being seen as a crackpot, he believed the native reports enough to actually include this description in his official report. Now, one of the things that made him believe the native tales, he didn't just take them on face value. He sought out and received multiple reports from non-native sources as well that included many of the same details that the natives had given him. So he compared the two and decided that this creature was a real creature and not imaginary. So I'm gonna read you now what he wrote in his official report. And I quote, the animal is said to be of a brownish gray color with a smooth skin. Its size is approximately that of an elephant, at least that of a hippopotamus. It is said to have a long flexible neck and only one tooth, 
but a very long one. Some say that it is a horn. A few spoke about a long muscular tail, like that of an alligator. Canoes coming near it are said to be doomed. The animal is said to attack the vessels at once and to kill the crew, but without eating the bodies. The creature is said to live in the caves that have been washed out by the river in the clay of its shores at the sharp bends. It is said to climb the shores even in daytime in search of food. Its diet is said to be entirely vegetable. This feature disagrees with a possible explanation as a myth. The preferred plant was shown to me. It is a kind of liana with large white blossoms with a milky sap and apple-like fruits. At the Samba River, I was shown a path said to have been made by this animal in order to get at its food. The path was fresh and there were plants of the described type nearby. But since there were too many tracks of elephants, hippos, and other large mammals, it was impossible to make out a particular spore with any amount of certainty." End quote. Now there's a couple of things here to point out and to consider. First of all, he says the diet of this creature is purely vegetable. That's all the information that he gathered. That was his conclusion. That completely contradicts the previous one where they said that its diet was hippos. But he made a point of saying it's vegetable here because he is saying that that proves that it's not a myth because if it was a myth, it wouldn't be eating vegetables. It would be this fearsome creature that ate people or something. Now this report is an important piece of evidence to us because here we have someone who not only didn't start out as a believer in this creature at all, and we know that because he actually tried to disprove the native reports by gathering reports from non-native sources. So here we have a man that knows if he claims that this creature exists in his official report, he absolutely knows that he risks being not only ridiculed, but also potentially losing his job and thus his station in life. So you know that he had to have tried very, very hard to make sure that this wasn't just a myth before he took that risk of losing everything. The fact that he included it in his report tells you a great deal about whether this creature exists or is just a myth. In 1980 and 1981, retired University of Chicago biologist Roy Mackle headed expeditions into the Lakula and Lake Tele regions of the Congo, which were said to be hot spots for this creature. Now, he didn't find the creature, and he didn't find any evidence of the creature's existence in either expedition. But he did gather tons more stories and eyewitness reports from the native people. Another expedition was launched by a Japanese film crew in 1992, and they captured what is known as the very best evidence for the existence of the Mokele Menbe. They captured aerial footage of a large shape that was parting the water in the lake. The footage appears to show the head of the creature moving through the water, but some people claim that it's a crocodile or a man in a canoe. Now, I don't know how much stock to put in those accounts of what it could be other than the Mokele Membe, because whenever you have something like this going on, you have these professional skeptic people, and their entire job in life is to deny any evidence they see and just say right away that it doesn't exist. If you're talking about something that is not known to science, okay, whether it is the Mokele Membe, whether it is Nessie or Champ, uh, whether it is Bigfoot, aliens, any of these things, right away, without even missing a beat or batting an eye, they are going to say it does not exist, it was swamp gas, or it was a stick in the water, or you just saw a bear, or... It's just a bunch of rednecks drinking too much beer and imagining they get abducted, whatever. They're going to make any excuse possible, no matter how unbelievable, to claim that whatever the evidence you are presenting is not what you're claiming it is. That's what they do. You have people in the science community that does that. You have people even in the comment section of YouTube and Facebook and every other social media thing out there. 
That's what these people do constantly, is they tell you it does not exist, and if you even consider the fact that it might exist, you are a moron. That is their basic message to you. But I'm here to tell you that it's okay to wonder if these things exist or not. It's okay to question and to look at the evidence in an objective fashion and not make pre-conclusions on either side of it. What we are supposed to do is to take each piece of evidence as it comes and examine it and make a judgment on that piece of evidence. And then we take the entire collection of evidence as a whole, everything known about the creature, and then we make a judgment on whether we believe that creature exists. That's what we do here on Staring into the Abyss. I do dozens and dozens of hours of research for every show, and I check out everything I can possibly learn about the thing, and then we make an informed, educated decision on whether we believe that this creature exists or not. And the beauty of this is millions of you listen to this show on the radio and on YouTube, the replays, and just dozens of affiliates. There's a bunch of you that listen. And I would guarantee that there's more than one viewpoint on every show. So in other words, some of you believe that the thing exists. Some of you believe the thing doesn't exist. Some of you agree with what we say. Some of you absolutely do not agree with anything we say. And that's all fine. That's why God, in his infinite wisdom, gave us brains that are able to reason. That's why we have judgment. That's why we can look at things objectively and make our own mind up. A hundred percent fine. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about people that do not look at the evidence whatsoever. They just simply say it doesn't exist and you're an idiot. And there are so many of those people and they drive me crazy. But rant over, back to the research. There have been more than two dozen searches for the Mukele Membe, and thus far, there is very little actual evidence of its existence. There are no photographs or film other than the aerial footage that I just spoke about that was captured by the Japanese film crew. There have been no bones or no teeth found either. All we really have are the native stories and all the different eyewitness accounts and the historical accounts that suggest that this creature exists. We know that in a couple of these that I've mentioned that they did extensive investigations to find out if this creature was real. Because you have to understand that when you go on an expedition, that costs a tremendous amount of money. Nowadays and back then. And you had these people that were adventurers. That's what they did. They went and they explored and they found new places. They discovered new things. And hopefully some of them were worth some money and that's how they made a living. But it costs money to get there. It costs money to to feed yourself. It costs money to make sure you had your supplies. All that stuff costs money. So they're not going to waste resources chasing something that's imaginary. They will do a preliminary investigation. They will see if there's enough evidence to suggest that whatever they are looking for is worth the amount of money they're going to have to spend to try to find it. So we know in at least three cases this was done. And they decided that there was enough evidence there to warrant further investigation. So there is the evidence that we have to decide whether we believe that the Mokele Membe exists or whether it is a myth. Now there are a few key things to consider along with all that evidence I've already went over before we make this decision. And these things are important. First of all, is the number of these creatures that would be necessary for it to continue surviving. Mokele Membe is not and cannot be a single creature that lives in a jungle. Since this creature is not a supernatural thing, but is instead a living and breathing animal, there has to be what scientists would call a breeding population in order for this creature to still be alive since the time of the dinosaurs. Like all other animals, this creature will grow old and die. So it is necessary for them to reproduce and create future generations to take their place. 
when you factor in enough genetic diversity to keep the animals from becoming inbred and thus becoming too sick to survive, you're looking at a population of at least several hundred of these creatures. Now that number seems large, but believe me, we're really pushing the limits with such a small number because in all reality, it should be much, much higher into the thousands at least. But I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt, and I'm just going to go with, the, with several hundred. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, can several hundred, or perhaps even thousands of these creatures, which are the size of elephants, live in the Congo River Basin, and avoid detection by everyone that comes to find them? Well, to answer that question, let's first look at the size of the rainforest and the swamps that make up the Congo River Basin. Now, we're talking about an area of 1.4 million square miles. Or for our listeners around the world that are not in the United States, that's 3.7 million square kilometers. Now, given that much of that is dense rainforest jungle, and swamps. I would say that it is entirely possible that there could be a breeding population of these things living there quite comfortably without being found. Now you might say, well, that's crazy, man. These things are gigantic. How can they not be found? Well, remember, we're talking about something around the size of an elephant or a hippo, okay? That was what the one account said. None of the other accounts make it any larger. So we're talking about that range. We know that elephants live in a jungle. Now, granted, they're they are found and seen, but maybe their population is more widespread than that of the Mukele Membe. Maybe the Mukele Membe lives deep, deep inside the rainforest and swamps where people don't go. Also, remember the silverback gorilla. Now, that was once thought to be a mythical creature as well by science. Everybody said you were out of your mind and stupid if you believed that the silverback gorilla existed. It was a ghost story told by savages. But then it was finally found after years and years of searching in the Congo. So there is precedent for a large animal being almost impossible to find in this area. Because a gorilla is not small. A gorilla is a big boy. So the next question that we have to answer is, can a species from the time of the dinosaurs survive into modern times. Okay, well, remember, as I said in the beginning of the show, that we have over a dozen well-known and scientifically accepted species that are still alive today and doing very well that lived in the time of the dinosaurs. So the answer to that question would also be yes. It is entirely possible for an animal from the time of the dinosaurs to survive into modern times. No stretch there. Another point to look at here is there is no real good reason why this creature couldn't still be alive. Okay, we're not talking about some supernatural creature here with powers that can fly across the sky and breathe fire and, and turn you into a toad. You know, things that would make it very hard to believe that such a creature could possibly exist, we are simply dealing with a flesh and blood animal that science has not officially discovered yet, but has several historical mentions and tons of eyewitness reports. And you can say the exact same thing about our old friend, the silverback gorilla that I was just talking about. Exact same scenario. It had historical reports of it, it had a lot of eyewitness accounts of the native tribes. It had lore and legend about it. And all the supposed smart scientific people completely discounted all of that and said it was rubbish. But as we learned, it was not rubbish. That creature actually existed, and now we know for a fact that it exists. So when you look at all this objectively, without predetermining what you think before you listen to the evidence, like I talked about earlier. If you throw out all the fear of people calling you stupid and crazy, you throw out all the ideas of it being silly, 
that a dinosaur could still be around today because we know that all these other animals that were around at the time of dinosaurs are, so it's not so silly. So you look at it objectively, it doesn't really seem that unbelievable, does it? There's no real good reason why it can't still be here, other than the fact that we haven't discovered it officially yet. But that doesn't mean it's not there. So the answer to the question, do I believe that the Mokele Membe actually exists? And the question, does a dinosaur still walk the earth in the Congo? The answer to that is yes, it might very well be true. Now, of course, we cannot definitively prove its existence until we have a body, or at the very least, some very clear and provably real footage of the creature. But I would say that the chances that this living dinosaur is still living in the Congo are pretty good. I don't see any reason why it couldn't be. Now, I'm not saying 100% it is, but the way I look at it, if there's no reason why it can't live there, and there's a whole bunch of people that say they saw it, and there's myth and lore going back generation after generation after generation that say that this thing is a real animal that lives there, and you had three separate historical investigations of this thing, and all of them came to the conclusion that it was there and it was real, one of which claimed to have gotten skin of the animal, I would say the chances are pretty good that it exists. For me to come down on the other side of it and say that I think it doesn't exist would mean that I am saying that I know better than all these people in the past that were actually on the ground investigating it, that actually held pieces of it in their hands, that somehow me sitting in my recliner, I know better than them. So I'm going to say it's possible. It's very possible, and I think that it probably does exist. To me, all the evidence points to it existing. Besides the fact that we don't have photos, we don't have, you know, tissue samples or or any like plaster casting of footprint or hair or scales or anything like that. But I would say from the evidence we do have, I don't see anything that points to the fact that it couldn't be there. So I'm going to say, yes, I believe that it exists. And I'm going to throw over to Old Boy, and I'd like to get his opinion on it, see what he thinks. Just see what he thinks of the Mokele Membe in general. They, to me, it's a, it's a pretty cool creature, you know? It's a little bit different than than a lot of the stuff we do on this show because we're not talking about a monster or we're not talking about you know a ghost or a demon or something that has supernatural powers that wants to hurt us we're simply talking about an animal and in my opinion that's what bigfoot is that's what the loch ness monster is that's what champ is the abominable snowman you know the yeti a lot of these little creatures man a lot of a lot of these cryptozoological creatures People call them monsters, but in reality, they're just animals. There's nothing monstrous about them. You know, when we deal with monsters on this show, we're dealing with supernatural creatures that mean us harm. These animals are just that. They're just animals. So I'd like to get Old Boy's opinion on all that, and I'm going to go ahead and throw over to him now. So take it away, brother. And thanks again, brother. This is one I wanted to do about Michele Membe. I've heard about the story since I was a kid because, like James, I'm a big dinosaur lover. And I've always wished that I could see dinosaurs, even though, I don't know, if you see Jurassic Park and you're like, man, I don't know if we could survive that. M McKelly Membe has been a story I've always known. And I first saw it on Monster Hunters, I think, like, eight, nine years ago. Even actually longer than that. I think it was, like, 10, 11. That's when I heard about this creature. And over a decade ago, and I've always been interested because I've always told James, let's do this story. It's really interesting. And he finally started getting some stuff. We started seeing some videos and getting evidence on this creature. It looks like a brontosaurus, but it's smaller, probably about half the size. Still about 30 feet long, longer than that was the long neck. It's probably like 40 altogether. And it stands about as high as an elephant, 15, maybe a little bit higher, 15, 16 in height wise with by the body and maybe even 20 somewhere around that area it's huge it's not small they have a, i seen footage of it 
of it swimming in, like he was talking about on the embankment from in 92 they showed the video you can't really see it though it's in black and white and you know how those videos are it's always shot from afar so you can't really tell you could tell it's big and people are going to say oh it's an elephant but this thing was swimming fast and it was bigger than an elephant this thing's like two times bigger than an elephant even maybe bigger and there's supposedly more than this because what james is talking about tribes there's supposedly a guy in 82 i think his name was thomas he was on the crusades out there for, uh, I think the, the Mormon Crusades, I think that's what it is, don't quote me. And he said he's, he met some of the pygmy tribes out there, and they said it in their legends, uh, at one time in one of their stories, they built this thing in the river, and it was halfway on the, it was like spikes, and they actually injured it real bad and killed one of the things, and they had footprints of it. But they said they were stopping it from these long neck creatures, and they said it was more than one, they said there's a whole bunch of them, there's more than just one in the Congo of Africa. And he said it, he saw bone, they were supposedly like, he saw the pictures of this where they had these things, spikes stick, sticking out and he saw footprints and they were huge, three by three feet by wide. So they're really big, really big feet. And you know how, I mean, you've seen how big dinosaurs are supposedly are in Jurassic Park. They're just really big creatures. And like, if you see the brontosaurus, it's huge. I think it has a new, another name now. I think they changed it, but it's got a long neck and it, those are like 60 feet with the next 60, even some of them can, I saw some of them can go up to 80. Back in the day, longer than that, some of them, all the way, I'm talking about lengthwise. And these things could, you know, you've seen it also can get on its feet and lift up big giant trees because some of those trees were really giant too in the Jurassic area, era. And you, they, they had to use their long necks to get some of this fruit because some of those trees were like hundreds of feet in the air. That's what they use their necks for. Well, these things are smaller versions of them. But they have like this, either this one tooth or they're saying a horn. And I think it's a horn because it would make sense. It's for their front defense because it doesn't have any other defense because it would probably use that horn to defend itself off. But that's weird because no brontosaurus had that kind of horn. So what am I thinking is maybe this was something that it evolved from because it, it evolved to survive because imagine having a hundred foot dinosaur walking around. You're going to see that. But if a 30 foot 40, 40 foot dinosaur walks around it can hide himself better and and think about it it evolved to have this horn sticking out to defend itself from like predators because there is giant still around you know you got you got the the hippos are huge people don't realize they're pretty big creatures so these giant alligators they get pretty big and you know you have elephants they get really huge and then they got giraffes there's all kinds of stuff running around here so it's going to have to have something to protect its neck because once it gets its neck, you're done. So that's why I think it has that beak or whatever it is, like a, a pointy nose or a tooth. Maybe James can explain what he thinks that is in a couple minutes after he gets uh, after I get done talking about McKelly. But I think that might be a defense mechanism uh, over the uh, mechanism over the years that evolved to have this extra horn to protect itself. Like like it's like a rhinoceros. It's def and you know there's stuff like that running around, so it has to defend itself. Because just a long neck, you know, and he said it was eating just vegetables. And then some people said he eats elephants and, and hippopotamus. Well, what I was thinking, maybe there's more in one species. Maybe they're, because they're saying they're seeing two different kind of, a couple different kind of dinosaurs. And then the only one long neck creature there's, so there may be a different breed of, and they eat different. But the ones that eat vegetables and, and plants, that would make more sense. Because that's what they were in the Jurassic. They just ate. Uh, fruits and vegetables and, and, and trees and, you know, plants, like James was saying in, earlier in the show. That would make sense to me. I don't think they attack people for a purpose. I think they probably just see somebody and the people, you know, like, you know, first reaction is you're going to try to run or you're going to attack the thing and try to kill it. So it, you know, it became enemies with these people. And the pygmies are smaller people, like two, three, like three or four feet tall. They're, these things are massive then. So and they're coming into their land, stealing their food. So that's probably why they were killing them off. And that's why that you had some of these um, things coming in because they probably were, you know, had, I don't know, fruits and vegetables picked and all kinds of stuff. So they would come in and take whatever they wanted. And the pygmies got tired of it and they probably killed them, killed a couple of them. And they defended themselves. They made this little um, spikes inside this little, I guess they showed it was like a, uh, a like a river kind of, but it was like. It was where they could stand it and, and attack the thing, so they killed it. That's what they say. So 
And then there's other people, like that one guy supposedly in 92 had pictures of it, but and they didn't want him to come out and show it, so they threatened the guy, because I guess they believe in, in Africa and the Congo there that, that the Makembe will come after them or it will bring bad luck, or they, it's some kind of magical beast. Because uh, what, what I first was talk about the, uh, the pygmies, after they killed the beast, they ate it, and they all died. So they think that was what the curse was, that it killed them all, because they killed they killed the the beast because he has some kind of magical powers. So they believe that, and they believe in a lot of stuff like that. You know, they're very superstitious there, just like a lot of people are everywhere. But they still believe in stuff like that: demons, witch doctors, monsters, and they still have that that faith they believe in, and they believe that thing is some kind of magical beast. So that's why they didn't want him to take pictures. They didn't want him coming back for revenge. Because they're scared of this thing. They really are. There's a lot of tribes that believe that this thing exists. And do I believe it exists? Uh, yes. I believe that there's too many stories. It's been being written since the 16 and 1700s. A guy wrote a book about it. Numerous stories through the 1800s and 1900s, even now. Even before that, they, even before they started doing the book in the 15 and 1400s, they said they have pictures drawn on the, even before that on walls of them attacking these things. Do I think it's impossible that these things existed, and, and and this is why I think they might have, because they didn't think the silverback gorilla existed, and they found it. They didn't think the giant squid existed, and it, it exists now. They're even saying the megalodon exists now. They got a picture of a 60-foot shark in a, a video, actually, down in a, in an oil well. They got a big shark now. So pretty much you're getting to the point where that's probably going to be real now, and, or it's not extinct anymore. It was real. It's just they thought it was extinct. So they didn't think these things existed, just like the Komodo dragon. They didn't think those existed until the 18, 1900s, and they found the island, and they existed. Giant. They always heard of stories of giant reptiles running around, and they found them. You're always going to have people saying they don't exist, they, but we find stuff every day, especially in the rainforests in Africa, jungles, and, and rainforests in the Congo. They find stuff all the time. So to sit here and say it doesn't exist, because even in... The rainforest, they talk about a giant monitor lizard that's 30 feet long, and people think that exists. There's Even in Asia, in Cambodia, there's this 35-foot uh, crocodile they believe exists. They already caught a 25-foot, so I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't doubt it. And there's giant catfish. There's all kinds of things getting pulled all over the place, especially around these jungle areas. I do not doubt there's something like that there. It's just such a big, vast place. And some of it, Africa is a huge continent as it is. It's bigger than the United States. Why wouldn't there be something like that? There's a lot of animals out there, lions, tigers, all kinds of creatures, rhinos, hippos. There's stuff we have never found, and especially deep in the forest. It's dark. You can get away with that. They don't. A lot of people don't go in the middle of the jungles because there's some of those habitats, uh, these creatures. I, I wouldn't want to get killed by some lion or tiger, and even the people there some of these tribes it's 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 sacred tribes out there they believe that you can't just walk in there and like you just like you don't know who you're doing they'll kill you too so you just can't just walk in and just think you can do whatever you want you have to talk to these tribes to get permission to go around looking and some of these tribes don't want you to know or find this creature because they they think it's sacred so that's that's another issue when people are saying well why can't we just find it you can't just go into somebody's backyard without permission and do whatever you want. You have to ask permission. So you have to go to the local governments there and try to get them to talk sense and these people let you go in there and get these things or take pictures. And sometimes they're hesitant. Like that one guy, they threatened to kill him. And that was the government. It wasn't even the people there. They don't want this thing. They don't want the, the, the news out there. They don't want people coming out there all the time. And that's a proven fact. They don't want the... the like they do with Loch Ness and Bigfoot, just gather out pictures, paparazzi, news, you monster hunters would be out there all the time. That That's why they don't want that. They don't want people disturbing their jungle. And I understand that. But I think these things do exist. It's not 100%. I know people are going to think I'm crazy, but I think these things exist. I've always have. I think dinosaurs didn't 100% disappear or go extinct. And it's proven because, like, sharks haven't gone extinct. They still survived. So do certain, um, you know, turtles, all kinds of stuff. Alligators. There's some creatures, the hilly fan, that was a fish that it, it still survived. And they didn't think it existed in it. And, and I mean, it, it went extinct and it's still there. 
I believe there's still dinosaurs, and not just in the Congo. I believe all together. I believe in the Loch Ness Monster. I believe in Nessie. I mean, not Nessie, um, Champ. I believe in the Thunderbird, the giant pterodactyl, because there's stories about that. They People killing them, and they have pictures of it. And then they said, oh, that's not real. But it, it, you look at it, it looks like it's real. People have seen these giant things flying around. How is that a giant bird at 30 feet and it looks, it looks like, a, like a dinosaur? <laughs> because I know some dinosaurs did were from birds. And they have, like, feathers and stuff. But this thing looks, they, the way they talk about it, it has a long neck with an elephant's body. That would make sense. Because that's what it, that's what it kind of looked like back then. I believe these things existed. I don't think they kill. Maybe they do, and I don't think they eat hippos. I just think that's their natural enemy, and they just kill them. So that's just one of their natural he enemies, and elephants and whatever. Those are their enemies, so they just kill them. They, they probably naturally just eat plants, but they probably kill them, you know, because they get in fights, because that happens. El uh, hippos are, mo are nasty creatures. I mean, people think, oh, they're funny looking. They, they, they're fast. They kill people. And they attack anything. They don't care. If they're hungry, they'll attack anything. I've seen them kill alligators. I've seen them attack lions. I've seen them kill other things. So they don't care. Trust me. And people don't get it. El hippos are, 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 are nasty creatures. And James will probably tell you because he knows a lot about all this. He's all into animals and stuff like that. But hippos, a lot of people misunderstand. They're one of the most dangerous creatures you can come at you. They, I mean, their teeth are, can rip you apart. They're nasty, nasty creatures. And elephants get mad. They uh, they have a lot of um, testosterone that comes out of their eyes, and it gets into their eyes. They go crazy. And they're big. People got to realize they're big animals. They have big old lion tusks that could it stab you. So it could imagine one of these things battling one of these uh, Michele Bembe, and it, that would be a vicious battle because it supposedly has a big giant horn. So that's a crazy battle or a rhino or something like that. So that's what I think. I think these things existed. I think there's too many people talking about it now. I just think that they don't want people to know about it because they don't want the government to come in there. They don't want another foreign government going in there telling them and trying to get their creature and trying to capture the thing and take it away. That's what they think protects them or uh, that's, their, that's some kind of magical beast. They, they believe that. It's got it's like a magical creature for them. So that's why I'm saying I think it exists. I think that they know about it, but they just don't tell us more about it. And I think some people they talk about it, but they tell the wrong people. And what's the first thing that people do? They go and tell everybody about it. And that's what happens. But yes, I do think these creatures exist. It's funny because if you talk to the people that run the safaris over in Africa, they are much more worried and concerned about the hippos and the rhinos than they are the lions. If they see a lion, it's like, okay, there's a lion, watch out for it. You know, you might have to shoot it or whatever if it gets too close. But if they see a hippo or something, they'll jump back in the vehicle and try to get the hell out of there. Because old boy's 100% right, hippos are dangerous, dangerous animals. People don't realize it because they don't look dangerous. They just look like big fat slobs that just kind of hang out. But they will charge you and trample the hell out of you. They are vicious. And one reason why if the Michele Membe is just killing hippos, because it's a natural competitor, so they are doing it out of survival or whatever, but they're not feeding on hippos. One way that would make sense is this creature lives in the waterways. Hippos spend a great deal of time in the waterways as well. So they're going to come into contact. They're going to come into conflict. So if a Michele Membe was to kill a hippo, most likely that death would take place either in the river or right next to the river. Now, you have a lot of crocodiles in the rivers there. And one thing crocodiles love to do is to scavenge dead bodies in the river area. So if a Michele Membe was to kill a hippo, to me it makes perfect sense that that, that body would disappear very quickly. The crocodiles would just get a hold of it and drag it down into the water, rip it to pieces, and that would be it. So it would make sense that the locals would think that, that maybe the Michele Membe was eating the hippos because there are going to be scraps left over that are going to be laying around. So they're going to see these, these ripped apart hippos with teeth marks and all that kind of stuff. They're going to say, hey, this, you know, something's eating this thing. What can eat a hippo? You know, hippo's badass. What can eat a hippo? It must be the Michele Membe. So that makes sense. One old trick for, for getting rid of bodies down here in America in the swamps 
was if you had a dead body, you could take it down to the swamp. And this is going to sound crazy, but I swear to God, it's true. If you fill the, the pockets of the dead body with marshmallows and you throw it in the water in the swamp, the gators here in America will just take a hold of that thing and rip it to shreds. And, and that's all there is to it. Alligators and crocodiles as well, as many people know, they don't have hands. You know, they have these, these little feet, or these little stubby legs. So it's not like they can, they can eat property like we do. And they can't chew either. They don't have the ability to chew their food. So what crocodiles and alligators do is they will take a bite of the animal. They'll get a good firm bite. And their, their jaws produce 2,000 pounds per square inch of pressure. Okay, a bite force. That's, that's like a 35 mile an hour car wreck worth of force. So they'll bite a hold of whatever they're trying to eat. And since they cannot chew to rip off a section of it, they do what's called a death roll. So they take a bite of it and then they roll their body over and over again. And what that does is it, it twists and rips off chunks of that animal. And then they'll take that and they'll eat it. And basically when they eat it, they swallow it down whole because they can't chew it. So once they've had their fill, they don't just leave the carcass. They continue to rip off chunks. They'll take those chunks under the water and they like to stuff them up underneath logs and everything because alligators and crocodiles both, they will eat fresh meat from an animal when they're hungry, but they like their meat a little more seasoned. They like it to rot a little bit first because what happens when when it sits under the water for a while, it gets a lot softer and, and the tissues begin to break down and it makes it easier for them to digest it and everything. So they will take those hunks of meat and they'll go and they'll shove them underneath rocks and underneath logs and stuff under the water and they'll let them sit for three, four days a week, whatever. And then they go back and get them and eat them. So the majority of that hippo that gets, that gets killed is going to end up either in the belly of a crocodile or stuffed underneath a log or a rock somewhere in the river. So you're not going to find much of it. You're going to just find little pieces because they, they don't have hands. Like I said, they can't go around picking up every little piece. You know, there's going to be pieces that are left over that are too small for them to be able to really get a hold of and, and drag anywhere. So that makes complete and, and total sense to me that it's very possible that if the Michaeli Membe is not eating the hippos, that that's why the majority of those bodies are disappearing. And I imagine if, if it kills people that are in a boat, I imagine that's going to happen to the people as well. Because the crocodiles, they'll eat anything. Because see, crocodiles, they're ambush predators, just like alligators are. How they hunt is they'll go to the edge of the river where the bank is, and they'll submerge their body all except for a little bit of their eyes. And they'll just wait. And Usually about once a year in Africa, they'll have the wet season and everything comes to the watering holes and to the river area to drink. Now, these crocodiles will wait and they will ambush animals when they come down to drink and they'll feed. Now, during the wet season, you might have three days or four days where animals are actually there drinking and the rest of the time they're gone. At the river areas, they're going to be there a lot more often because the river is always there. But if you're talking like watering holes, they only have three or four days out of the entire year that they can eat. And their metabolism is so slow that they can eat once a year, basically. Okay, now, the, granted, they're going to eat a hell of a lot of food in those three or four days. They're going to live off that for the rest of the year. The reason I tell you that is not just for useless trivia. The reason I tell you that is because any opportunity that a crocodile has to feed it's going to take that opportunity, especially if it's not during its normal feeding time. So if they come across a body, they're definitely going to take advantage of that. And they're going to feed as much as possible. So that's going to get rid of, of those bodies very, very efficiently. Uh, the thing about the horn on the head that old boy brought up, that's an interesting idea that, that it developed it for defense. That makes sense. Another thing I was thinking as he was talking of how the brontosaurus would get into the treetops to to eat the best leaves up at the top and everything. It could be if this thing is feeding off some sort of fruit as well that grows in trees up high, maybe that horn was developed for dual purposes. Maybe not just for defense, but also to help knock loose fruit and stuff like that or help rip away uh, branches that have good leaves that they want to eat or something. 
that they can't quite get to to get the leaves off of. Who knows? It's an interesting idea. Africa is a is a magical place because there's a greater diversity of life in Africa of wildlife than probably anywhere else in the world. I mean, you have a couple spots that that have a lot of different species of animals and where there's still a lot of wilderness left. You know, you have portions of the Rocky Mountains, Alaska, a great deal of that is still wild. Uh, Australia has a lot of, of wild areas in there with a, some really interesting and cool wildlife. Uh, you have the Galapagos Islands. There, there's some places on this planet where there's still things to discover. And people don't realize that, I think. A lot of people are shocked when, when they find out that a new species has been discovered because they think that we've discovered everything already. But I'll tell you an interesting little story. I, I was reading in a, a scientific journal that they go down to the Amazon rainforest, scientists do. They do these studies looking for new types of insects and small animals. And what they'll do is they'll take a, a machine that has a, a large belt. Uh, I don't know if you guys ever remember seeing the old black and white footage of the old days when uh, people were exercising, they would go into the gym and they would have that big belt that would shake the ever-loving hell out of them. It's something like that. This belt is hooked up to a, a machine that has a big motor and they wrap the belt around the tree and they turn the machine on and it shakes the tree. And what they do is they set up this netting system underneath the tree all the way around 360 degrees. And when they shake the hell out of the tree, everything that's in the tree falls down into that netting system. And then they go through and they look at all the different stuff they captured. And every time they do this, they come up with literally thousands of new kinds of insects they didn't even know existed before. Uh, in this one journal I was reading, they talked about a time they did this and they cataloged 10,000 new species of insect on that one trip. Okay, imagine that. 10,000 creatures that science had no idea existed out of one tree. That's amazing. And the Congo is a lot like the, the rainforest. It's a wild area that is not normally traveled by people. Some of the areas are, but there's a hell of a lot of space out there that nobody goes in. So it's very possible that all kinds of interesting things exist there that we've never even seen. Uh, the animal Old Boy was talking about earlier in the show was the, the coelophant. That's the aquatic animal that washed up on the coast of Madagascar. It supposedly went extinct millions of years ago, according to science. And then all of a sudden, it washes up on the shore. And people are like, what the hell is this thing? So they, they call in the experts, and they come and they look at it, and they say, oh my god, this is a coelophant. But it can't be because the coelophant went extinct millions of years ago, but yet right here it is. Our history is full of those kind of moments. Every single creature that is alive right now on this planet was at one time unknown to science. So at one time, there's a hell of a lot of different, I mean, we've went through the list. We got, you know, the Congo, uh, you had the silverback gorilla there, you had the giant squid, like Old Boy was talking about, the megalodon shark. There's all kinds of different species like that that were supposedly either mythical or extinct. You know, you have the, the Tasmanian, Tasmanian tiger. That's another one that supposedly went extinct a long time ago and there's people saying now that they think that it's not extinct anymore so history is full of those things that happen those events where something is found and they never knew it existed or it's found and they thought it was extinct a long time ago remember that dinosaurs have changed in the beginning every single one of them were giant lizards they had scales they looked like godzilla basically they looked like lizards now scientists think that a lot of them weren't reptiles at all. They weren't lizards. They were birds. And that is because of new evidence that comes up. But if you would have said, well, dinosaurs aren't lizards, they're birds, then a lot of the scientists, the paleontologists, would have said, you're an idiot. What the hell are you talking about? Of course dinosaurs are, are lizards. Of course they're reptiles. They lay eggs. Well, birds lay eggs too. They're not reptiles. It's all guesswork in a white coat. That, that's what I like to say about, about science and medicine. Both of those subjects, it's all guesswork in a white coat. They never have the definitive answer on anything because there's always new evidence that comes out that changes the way they think. You see this in medicine and nutrition all the time where 
one year eggs are horrible for you. Oh my God, you can't eat eggs. You're going to have a heart attack. They're the worst thing ever. And then the next year, oh, they're fine. Don't worry about it. For years, we've been told that cholesterol means you're going to have a heart attack. Oh, cholesterol is the worst thing in the world. If your cholesterol number is high, that means you're going to have this terrible heart attack and all this stuff. And they just released a study last week that was done by 17 of the top cardiologists in the world. And what they found in that study is that cholesterol has absolutely nothing to do with heart disease at all. There's no correlation between high cholesterol numbers and heart disease at all. That's what this study found. And it was done by 17 of the top cardiologists in the world. So all this time, we thought this one thing is true. We've been living our life that way. And now we find out they were wrong. I'm not saying science is rubbish. I'm a science guy myself. Okay, I worked for NASA. I, I've been involved in a lot of science. What I'm telling you is science does not have all the answers. And a lot of the answers science thinks it has have changed over the years as new evidence comes out. So don't be so quick to dismiss something just because you either think that we've discovered everything already, which is absolutely not true. There's a lot of places we haven't been that, that have some amazing creatures on them. Or that the science is settled. I hear that argument all the time about all kinds of different things. The science is settled. Science is never settled. Never. There's nothing in science that you can point to and say, this is settled. Even the laws of science, like the laws of gravity and stuff like that, we discover new things all the time about. I'll give you an example of that real quick, and then we need to wrap up because we're running out of time. Gravity was a constant for the majority of the time since it's been discovered. We go to the moon, we find out the moon has one-sixth of the gravity of Earth. So gravity is no longer a constant. The effects of gravity on the body are different if you're on land. They're different if you're in the water. They're different if you're in space. They're different if you're on the moon. It's not settled by any means. There's all kinds of things like that in science that most people think are unquestionable, but they're always questionable. There's always new discoveries being made. So that's about all the time we have. So I'm going to throw it back to old boy and let him do the shout outs. I want to give a shout out to everybody who's following Staring into the Abyss on Parax Radio. Thank you guys. We love you. I want to give a shout out to everybody who's following us on the YouTube pages. Uh, on the YouTube page, thank you. We're almost at 4,000 subscribers. Another thing, if you want to listen to our other shows, just always go in YouTube and subscribe to James Hershey's uh, page and you'll see him. So the big, the ball guy looks like Stone Cold, kind of. <laughs> and I want to say good night to everybody. I love you guys. Have a great night. Blessed be. Have a good night, demon hunters, monster lovers, and misfits. I love you. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with all the links tonight because we're, we're over time. So I'm just going to tell you that I love you, and I'm going to say thank you for all your support. And thank you for all the, the emails and the messages and stuff. We appreciate that a great deal. So until I speak to you again, love many, trust few, and do harm to none. God loves you, and so do we. Bye-bye.